You cast a spell on me is everything I ever wanted from a Hallmark movie. As a connoisseur of this formulaic film genre, I am delighted whenever I encounter something that not so much breaks the mold as kind of seeps out around the sides of the mold and creates something kind of unique. Like, it's its own thing. And in the eye of the beholder, it's either beautifully abstract or completely misshapen trash. Morning, babe. You Cast a Spell on Me was a Halloween Hallmark movie from October of 2015. So it has magic and witches and spells and romance. Outside of the Good Witch franchise, Hallmark doesn't really dip its wand in the fantasy waters too often. The only real exceptions are the 5,000 Hallmark movies at Christmas time where the guy turns out to be Santa. Let's have more Hallmark movies where the guy turns out to be like a merman or an alien or a time traveler or an angel. I say they should do more cross-genre movies like Hallmark in Space or Medieval Hallmark, Shakespearean Hallmark, or Hallmark in the Dystopian Future. I would love it. <laughs> okay, before I end up going on too many tangents, let's get into a breakdown of this movie. The male romantic lead, Matt, May I have your name? Yeah, it's Matt is a warlock who works for the family business, which is a juice company called Elixir of Life. Ever feel run down like you just won't make it through to five o'clock? Elixir of Life juices has the cure for whatever ails you. We have stress busters, energy boosters, and cold killers designed specially to keep you at your best all day long. Ah, uh, marketing. So Matt is 35 and he needs to get married to a witch by the time he's 36 or else he will lose his magic forever. Lizzie may be only 33, but Matt's just got a couple of more months before he's 36 and loses everything. Are we really sure that would happen? We've never actually seen someone's abilities fade at 36. I and mean, for all we know, that's an old wives tale. That's because we've never allowed anyone to remain unmarried. Ah, 36. That classic magical age. I mean, if you get your Hogwarts letter at 11, why can't 36 be the age that you lose your magic if you're still single? So Matt ends up in an arranged marriage with a family friend whose name I forget. Lizzie. I know. You don't want to marry me. You're saying you want to marry me? There are three which families that run this juice company and she is the daughter of one of the other families so if they get married it kind of unites their standing in the juice company against the third family but then at a friend's halloween party he meets our female romantic lead sarah so you are really marrying a woman just to keep a juice business together? She is a mortal psychologist who does already currently have a boyfriend named Alex who works at the Hadron Collider in Switzerland. I have a boyfriend. You have a sort of boyfriend. He doesn't live here and you guys see each other like three times a year. That doesn't make him any less of a boyfriend. Matt and Sarah talk all night and then in the morning before they decide to part ways forever, they kiss. And it's funny because when Matt and Sarah first meet, Matt tries to use his charm on her, which is this thing that we see him do throughout the movie that's actually really kind of creepy and problematic, where he uses his magic to essentially make women notice and flirt with him. Excuse me. Just a sec. Pardon me. 
<laughs> Why are you touching my elbow? <laughs> And then it doesn't work on Sarah, so he just kind of assumes that she's also a witch and starts interacting with her based upon that assumption. But she is dressed as a witch for her costume, so she thinks that they are just bantering and that he's like a little bit of an idiot. Although when I was watching this, some of Sarah's like bantery witch analogy statements were so on point that I had actually started to wonder if I missed something and she really was a witch. Like some establishing shot of her using a little bit of magic at some point. Let me guess, you're a caster. Do you have any other abilities? Oh, um, flight. I can fly. Don't try and use any of your magic charm on me. It's not gonna work. Clearly. Oh, you know a lot of mad sorceresses, do ya? Too many, and not nearly as skilled or powerful as they think. <laughs> but no, she wasn't. It was just very awkwardly filmed. Since Matt and Sarah parted ways, Matt continues trying to plan a wedding that he doesn't want with a fiance that also doesn't want to marry him, uh, while trying to expand the juice company. But then something starts to go wrong with Matt's magic. It begins just kind of malfunctioning. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sarah suddenly has her own magical powers, and she handles it poorly. I'm crazy, 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 losing my mind. Cookies. I So Matt has to figure out what's happening with his magic. And I love the fact that from that point forward, Matt's entire plotline just becomes about finding Sarah. Like he keeps mentioning this girl that he met at this party to enough people that they figure out that he is actually in love with this girl. And because it's true love, he managed to somehow transfer his magic to her. So he has to find her to try to get it back. It must be a great love then. I don't even know her. <laughs> Concurrently, Sarah's whole plotline is about learning how to use her newfound magical abilities to control and manipulate the world around her with zero regard for that random dude that she met the other night at that Halloween party. <laughs> Excuse me. Hello. And I said, yeah, sure, but then she was pointing at the door and she meant that I should go out before her. Go Dennis, I want you to listen to me carefully. Eventually, Matt finds Sarah and she gives him his powers back, but then they discover that she's an Aorist. How is this possible? You're an Aorist. You gain the powers of those closest to you. It's very rare magic. So now Sarah has her own magical powers. So she is a witch, after all, somehow. So Matt breaks off his engagement which the ex-fiance is totally cool with because she didn't want to marry him anyway, and it kind of gives her the kick in the pants that she needs to go and profess her love to this mutual friend that they have, who is this movie's equivalent of a squib. He is the son of that third family in the Juice Company, but he was born without magic. So he kind of was exiled a little bit but he and Matt's now ex-fiance have always had like kind of a thing. And then the last five minutes of this movie are basically pulled straight from somebody's like grown up AU Draco Malfoy self insert fanfic where Matt takes Sarah to this fancy party and she's wearing a beautiful dress and he tells her how impressive she is and how much more powerful she is than everyone else there at the party. What if the council doesn't like me? What if they erase my memory? They're going to love you. 
you have more power than most of these witches here. And he introduces her to everyone and to the witches' council, and they're all super impressed with her and amazed by her powerful magical abilities. You need to meet my future daughter-in-law. Oh, well, they're not engaged yet, but it's, it's any day now. I don't want to. She's an aorist. Did you hear that? I've never actually met one. Do you think she'd be willing to join the council? Happily ever after! Or is it? Because this movie has a lot of mysteries that never get solved. Firstly, was Sarah a witch all along? Was she an Aorist this whole time, but just never essentially had her magic activated because she had never met any other witches to absorb power from? Or did she somehow become an Aorist when she absorbed Matt's power and then gave it back and then the two of them like shared a true love's kiss or something? And secondly, what is an Aorist? I googled it and it's not a thing. The only thing I could find is that it's a word in Greek for a verb tense. So not magic, just grammar. And what the hell happened before this movie took place? Because they dropped some really interesting hints at some like potentially enormous backstory and it's never resolved. So Matt's dad died when Matt was a boy. He was apparently very skilled in rare magic and he was killed during something called the Cyclone, which Matt refers to when he's speaking to Sarah when he thinks that she's a witch, and he says it like she should know what it is. When did he pass? I was pretty young. The Cyclone. A freak weather accident. Also, apparently there used to be more witch families, but they keep either leaving or disappearing. In our day, there were so many more families. Remember the Roches, the Benantes, the Zavans? There must have been 20 of them. But so many of the kids that we grew up with decided to leave the life. What are they not telling us? For who is on the Witches' Council? Is it like the Witches' Council from Sabrina the Teenage Witch? Because that is pretty much exactly what I'm picturing. And how does it function as a governing body of these magical people? At one point they mention that roughly 60 or 70 people from the Witches' Council are coming to the wedding, which seems like a very large council for what is probably a very small group of people. Is there like a higher executive governing body? How does this work? Are people voted to be on the council? I want to know more about their established government. I am probably the only one who wants to know more about their established government, but I still do. Five, Matt's friend Colin essentially left witch society because he had no magic. He's the guy I referred to earlier as being essentially this movie's version of a squib. But at the end of the movie, he is able to use magic to move a cup. Um. <laughs> and Matt mentions that the Witches' Council will love Sarah because she has more power than anybody else in the room. So what is happening to these witches? Since this movie came out in 2015 and they have not yet announced a sequel, um, I don't think we're ever going to get a resolution to any of these mysteries. So moving on to my third section of this video, random observations. The first of which is that this movie actually has two different titles. There's the title, You Cast a Spell on Me, which is what I've been referring to it as. And then there's also the title, Some Kind of Magic. If you look for this movie now on Hallmark or on Amazon Prime, it will be under the name You Cast a Spell on Me. But apparently when it was released, it was titled Some Kind of Magic. So why did they change it? 
Maybe I should have put this under the mysteries section. Hmm. Another thing is that not only does Matt start this movie with a fiance, but Sarah has a boyfriend who works at the Hadron Collider. Um, and we see him twice over Skype, which is just enough screen time for them to establish that he is a cliche douchebag boyfriend, as we see so often in these movies, to establish the fact that it is totally okay for his significant other to cheat on him with the other romantic lead. It doesn't matter. It was an accident. Whatever. Um, I can tell you're having a rough day, so um, why don't you call me back in a couple of hours and we'll talk about it. But one thing that I do like about this movie is that throughout the entire thing, they keep Matt's fiance, who I just read in my notes is named Lizzie. I wish I would have checked that earlier. Um, they keep Lizzie as a very positive character throughout. Like they don't cut her down to make Sarah look better. They don't try to turn her into a villain. They don't have her competing for Matt's heart. I mean, have you thought about the fact that we're going to have to have kids? We have an election for that. They just, they establish her as being beautiful and kind and intelligent, and they keep her that way throughout the entire movie, and she's very supportive of Matt, and like she's willing to get married, but she totally doesn't want to, and yes, she ends up with Colin, the best friend at the end, but I still like that they kept her as essentially a good character. We understand you don't think you're in love, but you're not the most self-aware person. Maybe you don't recognize it because you've never seen it before. Okay. She just, she's nice. Also, unlike a traditional Hallmark movie, the leads kiss several times before the end. Normally, the leads will only kiss in the last five minutes of a Hallmark movie. Sometimes it's even the last shot of the movie, but usually the leads will only kiss at the end and then there will be like some kind of banter and then the camera essentially pans out and the movie's over. But no, in this movie, the leads kissing is what kicks off the main plot of Matt accidentally transferring his powers to Sarah and then they share their second kiss later in the movie in front of Matt's mom, which is super awkward, and then they have their third kiss at the end of the movie. And then the last thing about this movie that I want to talk about is the juice company itself, Elixir of Life. So it's owned and run by these three powerful witch families, and we find out that their juices are actually magic. They're putting magical potions into this juice which they are then marketing and selling to humans. So, of course they have some concerns with expanding the juice company because in order to like pre-package and sell their juices in retail locations, they would have to establish some kind of like factory setup, which means that they would be mass producing these magical juices and they would also have to get FDA approval. And I so wish we had gone into that more. I would totally watch a movie about a juice company that is secretly run by witches and they're trying to get FDA approval for their magic juice. Like that would be amazing. That would be so weird and mundane and I would love it. Also, they throw in an interesting tidbit about how selling this juice is the only way that they can get around the council's rules and use their magic to help people. But I can't help but wonder if perhaps there is a division within the company of some of the witches wanting to help people with the magic juice and some of the people wanting to find a way to essentially profit off of their magic. And in the scene, where Matt's mom and his fiance's mom talk about this, they seem to have two different priorities, while well, one is wearing black and one is wearing white. So it seems to be a visual color representation of perhaps which side of the coin they each fall on. Hmm. 
at the time I'm filming this, You Cast a Spell on Me is currently available on Amazon Prime for free streaming, so you can totally just go get yourself some magic or non-magic juice, whatever your preference, and sit down and watch this really strange Hallmark movie. Yay! Why does my voice sound shaky? <laughs> like I'm gonna start crying. Like it was just so beautiful and meaningful and it had witchcraft. Storm's coming. <laughs>